This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. There are few things more frightening than facing a crisis with your children. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of life or death battles and races against time on Rescue 911. We begin in Chattanooga, Tennessee on the evening of October 25th, 1989. For the Armour family, almost everything in life is harder. Both Annette and her husband Larry are deaf. They can neither call for help when they're in trouble nor hear any sounds of approaching danger. Annette's husband was visiting a friend that night, leaving her alone in the house with her three small children. She gave them baths, put them to bed, then went to sleep herself in her daughter's bed. The call came in as a burglary in progress. I think they gave some information about a man was seen in the house, which, of course, causes your heart to race just a little bit. His intent wasn't to steal the television. With the rope, and the knives, and his actions, put it bluntly, I believe he was in there to uh, rape Miss Arnold. He went through to the kitchen, acting almost like a blind man or something, almost like he was drunk. This really scared me to death. I don't understand why he didn't follow me. It was, it was at night, you know, and maybe he couldn't see me. I woke up my son, and I you know, told my son, there is a man here in the house. Please help me. We saw this man that was in my kitchen, and he was by the refrigerator. I told my son, come on, let's go, just be quiet. 
with no phone, Annette was forced to leave the house to try to get help, taking her five-year-old son, Larry, as her interpreter. I was wondering about the man, I hope he don't do anything to my kids, and I was very nervous. If I had woke them up, they would have been crying, and I was afraid that, that would have made the man come after us. I just didn't mean to leave my kids there for them to get any harm. When we continue. Your first instinct is, of course, to rush right in and try to protect children. But at the same time, you've got to use what you've been taught. Within minutes of awakening to find an intruder inside her bedroom, Annette Armour had managed to grab her five-year-old son, Larry, and escape. Deaf since birth and with no phone in her house, Annette desperately needed help. The two young children were still trapped inside. I wanted to call the police to come and get this man so my kids would be safe. I didn't want to lose any one of my kids. They're my family. The only neighbor Annette knew was the woman across the street. Odessa Ray. Must have been around uh, 1 30. We heard someone knocking at our back door. And uh, around here, you just don't ever get up and open the door. You're going to see first who it is. I knew right away something bad was wrong, you know, because that time of night and all. What's wrong with that? You can tell when anybody's in trouble. You can tell, you know, by their actions or motions and she told me she was asleep and that she woke up and uh, he was standing over her and uh, he was rubbing her legs i knew she needed help you know and so i just dialed 911. i was excited and i don't remember what all i told the operator 911 emergency can i help you could you send the policeman out to 1613 it's my neighbor and she's a mute and she says there's a man in her house. Okay, you live next door to Yes, I do, I know. Okay, ma'am. Is she at your house? Yes, yeah, she is right now, but she's got a baby, I think, in the house. Does she know the man that's in her house? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, ma'am, we'll get somebody out there. Say there's a baby in the house. I think so, uh, I, I, I needed to hurry up and get the police started on something okay, like that. Yeah. So I disconnected with her. Operator Sharon Feathers quickly passed the information to the dispatcher. I sort of put myself in that situation that if that was my children I'd had to flee from and leave in a house with a stranger, the terror that I would be going through. And you try to alleviate that terror as fast as you can. I was wondering what might happen, what he might do, if he might, might kill one of them. I know it was tough on her leaving her two little kids. She's foolish about her kids. I mean, she's really a good mother. Hello? Ma'am, this is the police department. That lady's still there with you? Yes, yeah, she is. She couldn't give you any kind of description at all about the guy or anything? Her little boy said he was, he was uh, black. That's the little boy if he knows the man. Is he there with you talk to him? Yes. Uh, you want me to see if he can talk to you? Yeah, let me talk to him. Okay, wait just a minute. Okay. <laughs> Hey, can you help me a little bit? Do you know that man that's in your house? Uh -huh. You do know him? Is no. He, you don't know him? Okay, does he break in the front door or something? No. Okay, but he's inside your house, right? It's okay, listen, I need for you to help me. This is the police department. We're trying to get that man out of your house, okay? How old are you? Five. You're five? Yeah. Okay. Do you know, is, your, is your baby brother somebody in the house? My, my sister and my baby brother in the house. Your sister and your baby brother in the house. Okay, where's that man at that's in your house? You know? Where'd you see him at? In my kitchen. He's in the kitchen. I instantly told Tim. I didn't even wait. He dispatched that out to the officers where the man was last seen. Then I stressed the point, do you know the man? You never had seen him before. The little boy assured me that they did not know this person. Officers Stone and Ganaway arrived at the scene. Unfortunately, they don't give us uh, anybody to tell who the good people are and who the bad people are on the call. So the more information, you know, as far as 
description or where they were last seen is essential, it's very important. Okay, I found the point of entry, got a broken window on the side of the house. It wasn't until myself and Officer Ganaway and Lieutenant Fusen, we were at the front door preparing to enter the residence, thinking that it was just a suspect. Then we were informed that there's a possibility there's two small children still left in the residence. Your first instinct is, of course, to rush right in and try to protect children. But at the same time, you've got to use the procedures and you have to use what you've been taught. Lieutenant Fusen went to the left to secure that area, and myself and Officer Ganaway uh, approached the kitchen. Officer Stone looked into the kitchen, and I could tell by the look on his face that he saw somebody behind the refrigerator. When we first saw him, we weren't sure what kind of weapons he might have, but my main focus at that time was just to secure the subject. Stand up. The suspect was ordered several times to keep his hands visible. I don't know if it was uh, drug-induced sluggishness or just his general mental state, but he was pretty sluggish. I then noticed that one of the children was behind him in a bedroom. If this suspect had suddenly decided that uh, he either did not want to be placed in custody or tried to harm one of us, that that child was about as close into my direct line of fire as, as it could be. Of course, without speaking, we realized we needed to get him away from that immediate area, and so he pulled him out of the way. We put him on the floor. This him. We began searching him and noticed uh, two sections of rope about a foot and a half long each that were in his pockets. We also found three butcher knives, which he had concealed in his boots. The rest of the house was searched. When it was found to be clear, they turned all the lights on. And by that time, other officers had come in and uh, they were with the children. I felt very relieved that there was no, no harm done to my children. And the police said, you are very lucky. And I said, oh, I am. I am very lucky. The man arrested at the scene that night is awaiting trial for aggravated burglary. Three months later, the Armour family still has not forgotten the events of that night. I was afraid, and I went and run home to see my wife, see what had happened. And I asked my wife, are you hurt? And she said, no, she was safe because my son had called the police in 911. And I was very thankful that my son had helped my wife. And I'm very proud of my son, Larry, for what he did. Had he not been with her, I don't think that anyone would have understood what, what her problem was, because I think he did a fairly good job of interpreting, was able to communicate with the neighbor and give us additional information that we needed. With the help of several local organizations, the Armour family was able to get their first telephone, including a TDD unit specially designed for the deaf. The TDD is really the only window to the world for some of these families who are hearing impaired. They can communicate with the TDD just like you and I can with the telephone if there's a receiver on the other end. And in our community, we're fortunate in having these terminals on the other end at law enforcement office, the medical center, so that they can call 911. I am so happy about this. My son, he almost got wild too. I had to calm him down and said, oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't, you can't be calling grandmother all the time and because uh, my relatives don't live here. They be long distance. I'm so, so proud of him. He is a real smart boy. He is teaching the other two sign language, too. I love him so much.
not just one, but all of them, all three of my kids. Next, as long as you keep your eyes and ears open, and watch out what you're doing. It's really not all that dangerous. By 9 a.m. on August 10th, 1989, longtime friends John Horseman and Harold Gerber had already been hard at work for hours in a remote forest outside Bellingham, Washington. They had no idea that it might be the last time they would ever work together. I like watching trees fall down. You watch them fall, and they, they hit the ground, and they kind of bounce around like a fish out of water. And as long as you keep your eyes and ears open and, and watch out what you're doing, it's really not all that dangerous. We started work about 6 o'clock, and we worked straight through. I was cutting on timber on my strip, which were, is where I cut trees down and, and buck them in the log length. And Harold was working his strip, doing the same thing. And we worked for several hours that morning. He fell a tree, and then he jumped up on it, and he bucked it in the log length. They'd already been working for six hours that day when Harold noticed a log up the hill from him that looked unstable. He looked back at it. He realized that log wasn't, there was nothing holding it there. It was on a steep side hill, you know, about probably 65% slope. And he, he looked at that log up there and thought, this doesn't look safe. Harold tested the stability of the 3,000-pound log. But when he found he could not move it, he returned to work on the slope below. John could not hear Harold's whistle or cries for help because he was wearing earplugs. I was gassing myself, and as I gassed it up, I looked back down the hill, and I didn't see Harold or where he should be or anything else other than his saw and his hard hat. So I pulled my earplugs out at that time to listen down, and as I pulled my earplug out, I could hear him say, John, Harold! get me out of here. Hey, Harold, just hang on. I'll be right there. So I was real scared for him, and, and so I dropped everything at that point. I was afraid when I first seen him, and Harold says, my hips broke, and he says, I'm crushed inside, John. I can feel it. John had enough training in emergency first aid to realize the seriousness of his friend's injuries. His pelvis was, it was either crushed or broken, and there was blood seeping from the head of the meatrum at that point. And I knew then how serious his injuries really were. And with the logs being unstable and rolling around, if they roll, that top log would just crush him to death right there. So at that point, I run to my pickup and called for help. Breaker, breaker out there. Anybody got a copy? I got on the CB, and I started calling for anybody that, that could hear me to call for help. And I picked up a truck driver who was working on a different logging site not too far, a couple miles away from me. And I said, it's your ball. You have got to get me help as quick as you can. Harold's dying. There's nothing I can do for him. Hey, guys, somebody's hurt over on John's side. Head on over there. While John continued to radio for help, three loggers set out to run the three miles to the site where he and Harold had been working. Yes. A trucker in Bellingham was the next to pick up John's urgent call. He quickly got the basic information about the location of the accident and ran to the nearest phone to call 911. 911? Yeah, 
Yes, uh, uh, I was listening on TV on Channel 7, and the guy was looking at one of the ambulance and a uh, helicopter, there was a logger with a pin uh, on Canyon Lake Road. The first information was immediately relayed, and three ground medical units were dispatched to the scene. Prospect to welcome and medic one, have an aid call, Canyon Lake Road. Only information we have is some loggers need an ambulance and a helicopter. Prospect to welcome and medic one. We're now getting it as Township 39. East, 33 and 34. They're advising you'll need the four-wheel drive rig to get them. Contact the Kendall. Kendall. Can you pass the word along that that flight will be in the air in just a few minutes? Yeah, will do. Good. Can you sir? Thanks for helping. Yep. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. There's no doubt he was in shock, and when he when he was laying there, you think he says, "You think I could possibly die?" And I told him, "Harold, I don't know. You're gonna die, believe me, but you better not die right now." It took about an hour to get to the scene by the rough and winding logging roads. The first unit to arrive was the Welcome Volunteer Fire Department, led by EMT John Heiser. We're running out of time, and it's what they call, a, the surgeons call the golden hour. You know, the first hour after some major trauma like this, they want that individual in the hospital with the best chances of surviving or within that first hour. And we just about used that up getting there. Worried that the log might roll back onto Harold again and kill him, the loggers decided to risk moving. Harold was still conscious and alert, but he had lost a lot of blood by now, and you could tell by just looking at him. And it was real hard for me, you know, to just kind of stand there and say, this guy is dying and I can see it happening. And not being able to help him was real frustrating to me. But at that time, John Heiser was coming around the corner with his stuff and the spine board. And then we all we had to do then at that point is lift Harold and set him on the spine board. And help started coming real quick after that. Paramedic Tony McQuinn was next. We found Harold talking, but he was in severe pain. He was very pale. He didn't have a palpable pulse on his wrist. And any movement at all, he would really wince or yell in pain. He had lost a lot of blood because of his injuries, so he placed uh, what's called mass pants on him and inflated those to stabilize his pelvis. He needed a surgeon immediately. By road, it could take an hour and a half to get Harold to the hospital. By helicopter, it would take only eight minutes, and every minute counted. At that point, I was demoralized. I just like losing your, losing your best friend, basically, and that's what it was. That's how I felt at that point. It was more than I could handle at the time and, and try to keep myself calm. And then uh, when they finally put him in the helicopter, at that point, there was a real loss. Something was being taken away from me, and, and I didn't know if Harold was still going to be alive when I got to the hospital to see him. Harold was flown to St. Joseph Hospital South Campus in Bellingham. Dr. Marvin Wayne headed the emergency team. Whenever we hear of pelvic injuries, a patient can literally bleed to death because of bleeding in that area of the body. So with the extent of the injuries that he had, with the crushed pelvis, with the torn urethra, with the collapsed lung, had he not been extricated and stabilized in a timely manner, Mr. Gerber very well might not would have been with us here today. I feel fortunate, I feel lucky to be here. But apparently, the way I look at it is apparently it wasn't my time. After a month and a half of bed rest, Harold's fractured pelvis has repaired itself. Life with his three children and his wife Janet is almost back to normal. He's a very good-hearted person. It's one of the reasons why I married him. He always comes in the door happy. 
you can be madder than hell at him and he'll come in the door at me and it'll wreck it. <laughs> Though Harold's recovery has been remarkable, he may never be strong enough to return to timber cutting. What's the next step? <clears throat> Get healed up and continue to march on, to, on with life. I would do anything for Harold. And whether or not Harold ever comes back to work in the woods again, old Harold and I will still be going fishing and we'll still be going hunting because we don't work on the weekend. Next, being thrown out of a boat at 110 miles an hour and hitting water is like hitting a concrete wall. Professional outboard racing is one of the fastest growing spectator sports in the United States. Most of the footage in this story was taped at racing events around the country. IOGP, it's the professional end of the boat racing. Most guys are coming from all over the world and they run for prize money and it's a lot of fun. It's also a very dangerous sport with competitors pushing their power boats to speeds of more than 100 miles an hour. Back in the early days when we first started, drivers were thrown out of their boat and we had the possibility of them getting run over by their own boat or getting run over by other boats. Being thrown out of a boat at 110 miles an hour and hitting the water is like hitting a concrete wall. And there's no giving in the water. Tougher safety measures, including a four-point harness and reinforced driver's capsule, allow most racers to emerge from high-speed crashes without injury. Ho, ho, ho! And yeah, that was number 57, Mark Trotter. But when a racer does need help, the star rescue team is on the scene within seconds. There has been a lot of drivers that have refused to race if we're not there. You know, one of the problems is they've got to where they have so much trust in us sometimes that they might push a little too hard. The stars include firefighters, paramedics, and divers, all volunteers who travel around the country providing emergency services at racing events. You're so used to all these accidents, and most of them, a driver comes up, you know, he might have a sore shoulder or a pulled muscle in the leg or something like that, and that's about the only injury. They don't even go to the hospital usually for a checkout. On August 12, 1989, Chuck Walker was scheduled to compete in St. Louis, assisted by his friend, Charlie Ivora. I drove the van and the boat up to St. Louis, and Chuck flew up that weekend. Chuck's wife was not at the races that day. We were all real excited for him, and I went to all the races, and he's always done good, but this race, both of us weren't able to go. You know, I was really scared not to go, because I was afraid something could happen if we didn't go. Charlie helped Chuck make his final preparations. It was his first IRGP race, and he was a little worried about that, but he's very competitive, and he only knows one speed, and that's all out. You know, he went back out of it. You don't want nobody to pass him. The race was getting ready to start, and the official comes around. We go through a, a visual inspection, safety harnesses, setting Chuck in the boat, strapping him in, make sure everything's all right before we get it out on the water. What? The race was a qualifying heat for the 1989 World Championship Grand Prix. 40 seconds, drivers, 40 seconds. Each qualifying heat as important as tomorrow's main event. 30 seconds, drivers. Modified Le Mans start. 20 seconds and the flag is up. They're under starter's orders. Jeff Titus, official starter, IOGP, and down goes the flag. And number 37, Chuck Walker, Boca Raton, Florida. He gets a late start away from the dock. Chuck had to start a few seconds after everybody else left, but as soon as he took off from the dock, he passed about five boats. He looked real good. He was running real strong. The boat was running real good. One of the star rescue divers that day was Buddy Kamen. We had four rescue craft on the course. I was on turn four and started out to be a real good day. Well, 
Chuck didn't get a real good start, but he was coming on around. And Meyer goes to the inside, and that puts number 50. Glenn Reynolds up in second place. And oh, we got one over down here. That was the late starting number 37, Chuck Walker. The accident looked like a training accident almost. It was so slow. At that point, I thought, before I can enter the water, he'll be out of the boat. It was right in front of me on that one turn right there. I was like, I could have walked out to him in the water. Anytime we have an accident, we stop the race immediately. And then we have the closest boat to the accident respond in. And all the boats have come to a stop. The red flags are out. My craft responded. I was in the water in approximately 15 seconds from the time the accident happened. I went down the first time, and Chuck Walker was conscious at this time. He took his helmet off, and he grabbed my hand and put it on his harness. He was thrashing about. He struck my regulator. I could not take any air from it. Buddy's regulator was broken. Neither one could use it. And they've got the driver out. So when I saw the helmet come up, I remember the crowd clapping and the announcer saying that the driver was out. Just a few seconds later, I realized there was nothing in that helmet. And that's when Buddy called me, come in real fast, there was a problem. When I jumped in, he advised that he had equipment malfunction. Then the five-point harness wouldn't release. Another diver, two divers going to the water. By the time the second diver got to the driver's capsule with his air supply, Chuck was unconscious. After 30 to 45 seconds, I was getting real concerned because they should have had him out by then, you know, or he should have been able to get out by himself by then. As the crowd watched, divers, including Clay Ingle, struggled to release Chuck's harness. As I entered the water, I knew they had a problem out of the ordinary, and so I was already prepared for the worst. You could tell he was unconscious. His eyes were slightly open, and he wasn't breathing. As soon as I realized that we couldn't get the belts undone underwater, I immediately went back up and hollered for somebody to hand me the seatbelt cutters. It was a bad situation. Tensions were up. We still wasn't sure on the extent of his physical injuries. So the quicker I can get them out, the better. Or they'll start the drowning process. Could have right in front of the crowd and right in front of the judge's stand. And I remember during the rescue, not hearing anything. Just seemed like it was deathly quiet. It was taking too long to cut Chuck out of the jammed harness. When I saw him like that, instantly a timer went off in my mind. Okay, time is a factor. You know, let's do what we have to do. It's hard to get him out upside down because buoyancy and everything will keep him pushed up in there. Above the water, they were trying to flip the 1,400-pound boat. We need to hurry up and get this boat turned over or this guy's going to die. You know, when you got a life in balance like that, minutes seem like hours. We rolled the boat over. Clay was still with him at that time, cutting the safety harness out. At that point, he was non-breathing. I started artificial respiration on him. When I first saw Chuck after he flipped the boat upright, I didn't know if he had any internal injuries or if he had any neck injuries from the wreck itself. I thought he was dead when they pulled him out. His eyes were rolled back in his head. He was purple as can be, and he wasn't moving.
Paramedic Randy Sammons coordinated from the shore. We felt we had something pretty bad because we'd been underwater at least two to three minutes without oxygen, so we were preparing for the worst. They came to shore, the patient was cyanotic and was having a full-blown seizure. His seizures was full body, arms and legs, just thrashing around uncontrollably. Well, seizures can be caused by many things. This particular instance, I feel it was due to the anoxia, which is the lack of oxygen, which he had because he was underwater for that length of time. They began treating him with oxygen immediately. I knew we had a pretty good chance to revive him, even though he'd been under the water that long. I thought I was going to have to come back and tell his wife that he was dead. But I had a little relief when I seen the doctor stick, stick her head out and give me a thumbs up. By the time the ambulance left the scene, Chuck was breathing normally. He was taken to St. Anthony's Hospital for further treatment. When I went up there Sunday, he wanted out so bad, you know, the doctor wouldn't release him. He was getting ready to the IV out because the race was getting ready to start. He wanted to go to races. By the next day, Chuck Walker returned to the races as a spectator. I relayed the information to all the rescue crafts and even the pickup boats. And it just seemed like a whole air of newness came over them that Chuck was there. Five months later, the accident is still a vivid memory for Chuck and his family. I was in no fear whatsoever. When the boat flipped, I remember it going over just plain as day. I kept saying to myself, I said, those stars are going to be here. Those stars are going to be here. They're going to get me. I think if this star rescue team wasn't there, Chuck would have been dead. I think they're the greatest. And I welcome them in my home anytime. They're just a great, great bunch of guys. I'm not going to say the boat will never flip over again, because if it ain't going to flip over, you're not driving it hard enough. You know, I kind of had a bad experience, but I feel like I'll be back next year. I'll be ready to do it to them. You know, 100% ready. I like him racing, but when he's in a really bad accident, I really don't want him to race again, because I see he's the best daddy in the whole wide world. Next. Mo was born a police officer. Woo Thank you, brother. Oh, oh. Almost you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say will be used against you in the court of law. Many of the best cops around the country have a style all their own. What follows is not a recreation. It's the story of one unique New Orleans police officer. Some police officers are trained and some are born. Mo was born a police officer. This Nelly. Oh, Nelly be out. She, she, she's secret. She mostly stay hidden. And old Sally is she where you could see her. She's still on my side most of the time. I always had one of the gun. I ain't no fool. Somebody got 16 shots, and I only got six. I mean, two for one. <laughs> Might blew my brain, though. Every night, Officer Linnell DeSil bids her 12- and 13-year-old sons good night and heads to work. The 6th District is a fast-moving district. It also has the most killings. We might have three or four shootings in one night. Big guns. Don't open my door for nobody. With its five housing projects, Moe's Beat is one of the toughest in the country, and she often patrols it alone. I grew up in the Lafitte Project, and that's where I learned to do a lot of things. I learned how the drug deal go down. I learned how to defend myself, how people carry guns. Made me very streetwise. I done rock. I thought you were going for a gun. Thank you, brother. Oh, oh. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say may be used against you in the court of law. You have a right to an attorney. You cannot afford one. The court will appoint one for you. You understand your rights? Okay. You're under arrest. Okay. Possession of rock cocaine. Oh, where is it? Where, where the did gun? Where throw the gun? You gotta be in these bushes. 
You gotta bring the bush. My favorite thing is getting a gun. Guns kill people in the wrong hands, little children. A drug dealer might throw a gun down, and a five-year-old might pick it up and point at another one and say, bang, bang, but the gun go off, bang, bang, and it be dead. You've been shot a lot. Damn. She's got a nose for guns. She can sniff out a gun like a dog sniffs out uh, perpetrators. She has a, an enormous amount of informants that nobody else can seem to get. A tip comes in. A crack house may be operating out of an apartment in one of the projects in Moe's district. They mess with drugs in here. I'm not going to lie. They mess with drugs in here. Like well, that, y'all got, that, that's why y'all ain't going to have, they ain't going to have this apartment long. I'm going to see for that. I'm going to call housing authority. They ain't going to be a fool in there. It's already, it's already been done. Huh? You want, you, you, you want a bag, what? No one is home but a teenage girl, nine months pregnant, and her four-year-old son. They ain't cooking up, cooking, they cooking, they so been cooking, they cook, crack. Look, see all that paraphernalia, all that, all that. See any groceries up here? <laughs> <laughs> see groceries? You got people on welfare, sell their food stamps and they turn out have no food. I see a lot of five-year-old who come home every day and the only time he eat is at school. Why they ain't got no light? Why the refrigerator in the bedroom? Why don't we put the red in the bedroom? Somebody don't do crack in here. If you had to be in the cold, in the rain, when you come home, nobody ain't there to tell you to brush your hair, brush your teeth. You don't have no food in there, nothing to eat, not even a piece of bread. When he's 16 years old, remember, you made a cold-blooded killer. He said, I'm cold-blooded because nobody never felt sorry for me. I you felt sorry for me. And I used to come home with nothing. And that's how you get a cold-blooded killer. That's right, Chanel. Right here. 627 North Me Road. Right there. I lived there for many years. Mo returns to the projects where she grew up. It's been good. <laughs> You've been all them years. I just put that on to come down. I'm going to go to church. And you're going to church? Years ago, we could sleep with the door open. Everybody knew everybody was... It's not hot. They can't sleep with their door open like that. They can't. Now you gotta, you gotta keep everything locked. The screen door, everything. Feel that uh, you might uh, hit the floor. They start to shoot. Boom, 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 boom. It's uh, ridiculous. And see, I love my man. It's over 20 years old. And I love my grandma to the dead till now. And she dead in the grave. But she taught me a lot of values that I never, never would forget. That you don't have to steal, you don't have to do none of that to make it in life. You can have everything, somebody might take you a little while longer to get it, but you can still get it. She taught me those values. Go ahead. You don't gotta drive that car. You must not want it. Sticking it out like that. She apparently feels like it's her responsibility, not only to raise her family, but everyone else's. And the minute that they get out of line, she treats them as if you've done something horribly wrong. What you just, all you need, all you need. Yeah, right there. What you got under the seat? In the St. Thomas Project, Mo stops three teenagers out cruising in their mother's van. Hidden under the seat, an imitation shotgun is found. Second time I done caught you, what'd that tell you? You got a bad streaky like for running into the police, huh? And you need, you need to stay from where I'm at. I know you're back here doing evil, like getting uh, robbed. Uh, <laughs> no. uh, it's 2.20 it. in the morning. You're 16 years old. I'm going to fix you. Let me tell you. I'll let you freeze. I'm going to fix you better than your mama can fix you. See, I'm going to make you walk home in the freezing cold and then tell your mama come get her coat. <laughs> she does call their mother. And an older sister comes to drive the van home. On this, his second offense, the 16-year-old is arrested for driving without a license. Mo spends as much off-duty time as possible with her own sons, Karan and Claypon. We're not rich, but if anybody go without, it'd be me. They won't go without. And they know I'm always there for them. They depend on me. A call reporting a domestic situation in one of the projects sends Mo to the scene. Where you on for? Huh? Where you on for? He live here? Mm -mm. What you doing with his gun? I'm holding it. You was holding it. You're under arrest for having possession of a firearm. Oh. Oh. 
Come out here. Don't Wait. judge me. Come out, girl. Let her go. Let her go. Wait, you're he under arrest. You, 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 look. In other words, you're telling me it's all right for him to hit you in the head with a gun. He didn't hit me in my head with no gun. Well, where you got that mouth from? I don't know where, where I you get this mouth from. I don't know where I get this mouth from. He didn't hit me with no gun. Wait, wait, miss. Hold up, miss. Come back here. Miss, why are you lying? The other night, me and my cousin then was home. So he, tried. he was turning the gun in her back while it was loaded. So it must have wasn't loaded the night. So he had the gun in his hand when I walked right. in the room. That's all I need, darling. You don't have to worry about it. Now, if you love him that much and let him misuse you, that's you. I ain't going to let him miss you. I ain't going to come home one night and find you laying on nobody's floor. Because I love you. I don't care who it is. Is your, who house it is? It's your house. It's your house? It's your old man? You like what's going on, huh? Well, he's going to shoot you one time and she's clicking that gun at you. You're gonna wind up, you're gonna wind up really shooting at one time. Yeah. yeah. And then what you gonna do, serve time? And say you're sorry, you shot him, cause you flicking black gums and ain't stupid? My attitude is, if you wanna be helped, then I can help you. If you don't wanna be helped, that's fine too. And most people who wanna be helped, they, they, they gladly take my advice. And those who don't, you know. What can I say? Let me tell you something. He got a problem up there, you understand? Oh, yeah. He need his ass kicked. He she has a rapport, not with just some people, but with all on the streets, that they know that they are a person, and she respects them for that. But if they mess up, then they have to deal with Mo, and that's not always good. That's not always good. In an emergency, help can be just a phone call away. Learn the emergency numbers for your area and post them at every phone. This series is dedicated to the real heroes who risk their lives to save the life of a stranger. I'm William Shatner. Join me next week for more true stories on Rescue 911.